Joining us now is News Corp columnist Louise Roberts and news.com.au entertainment reporter Bronte Coy. Ladies, welcome to the show. Louise, I've just talked about how Charles appears to be doing royal visits differently, but are there more political minefields perhaps for royal tours these days than in the past? Hi, Caro. Look, no doubt there will be. I think any country they go to which is used to be part of the colony or indeed still part of the Commonwealth now, there'll be questions asked about past um, issues, past crimes, past violence. And I think we are in a new era, the very much so that Charles felt he had to express regret. But note that he wasn't apologising because he can't apologise for it. And, of course, the Queen didn't apologise for anything around the colonial era as well during the day. So I think I think it's very important that Charles has made that step forward. I think um, and it's important that we don't then weaponise it against the royal family. Like, for example, when we had uh, Kate and... Charles and, um, in fact, Kate and William um, last year in Jamaica and they were shaking hands with the little school children through the fence and they were criticised for somehow insulting local Jamaicans, which is absolute rubbish. So we have to be very careful that we are seen to be moving forward but not blaming everything on, on the current royal family. And, Bronte, do you think this is the new mode for royal tours and do you think it will play better in the current times? Absolutely. Exactly as Lou said, it's a new era. It definitely feels like a new tone for the royal family. As we've just mentioned, William and Kate's tour of the Caribbean last year really should have been a, a massive celebration of the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. And instead, there were some moments that were pu pulled out because there were photo op blunders or things that became... They, took out, they were taken out of context and became a much uh, bigger story than what was actually happening on the day. But Charles here, he's really hit the ground running. That first night, he gave that uh, beautiful speech at the state banquet and it made his position clear. And I do think that he's looking to forge new relationships, leaving these countries as friends, making it clear that this is a new chapter in the relationship between Britain and these countries. And I think that's really important. I think we're going to see a lot of it. I do think he's, he's refusing to shy away from the horrors of the past, but he's also doing a good job of looking forward to the future. And, Louise, I thought the Kenyan tour was quite seamless, uh, but it didn't escape the criticism of Omid Scoby, who is a commentator connected to the Sussexes. What was the problem? Well, the issue Mr Scoby raised was that um, Charles and Camilla were walking on red carpet. The red carpet had, in fact, been rolled out. They were in Nairobi Park and they were walking on the red carpet. But, of course, if you see the footage, which I think we're about to show in a minute, that um, they actually walk off the red carpet. In fact, Camilla is standing to one side. And these are people who are not fussy. I mean, you know, these are people who hunt and fish and mud is no stranger to them at all. So I think to um, make an issue out of the red carpet which is, you know, universal shorthand for having a VIP in town. And let's also be clear that, that the fact the carpet was there, everyone was happy to have it there, the guests and also the hosts as well. If it was an issue, then it would have been removed. It was obviously deemed to be more offensive to the Kenyan host to actually get rid of the carpet. So, to me, it's a bit of a storm in a teacup. Bronte, sticking with the Sussexes, there's a report this week that they're fuming because Will and Kate... Uh, because of Will and Kate's A-list connections. Look, they're the next king and queen. It's hardly surprising. Oh, absolutely not. Also, we're talking about A-list connections. I mean, this is Hollywood. This is a town built on connections. The number one thing is who you're connected with because that's how you keep on building. And who better than the future king and queen? I think that when Harry and Meghan first moved there, they were the escapee royals and they people saw a big opportunity to grab them and pull them into their social circles and have some royals in their celebrity circles because obviously there's a lot fewer royals than there are celebrities, so they are a cut above in terms of social status in, in Hollywood. But, of course, over the last few years, what we've seen is a lot of the shine has come off Harry and Meghan. It's clear that they're very estranged now from the royal family, so that royal connection isn't as strong. Uh, and William and Kate are steady. Whatever you think of them, they've not changed their standing in the royal family. They're not going anywhere. In fact, they will, as we've said, be the next king and queen. So it's really not surprising that now that they're making these reaches into the US a bit more, apparently they're calling in their A-list friends uh, for help uh, bringing more attention to the Earthshot Prize and pushing forward that climate initiative. Uh, it's not surprising that they're getting a really receptive response because why wouldn't you pick up the phone to them unless you're Harry and Meghan, of course. And Louise, I guess the thing, you know, we always come back to this, who advises these people? But did they ever consider that the outcome would have been similar for them if they'd not left the royal family? 
No, I don't think they did. They were uh, they were really riding on a wave of self-righteousness once they arrived in Los Angeles and they figured that all their celebrity friends would, you know, buffer them and continue to, you know, pay homage to them in a way. But the fact is, I mean, to Bronte's point, that if you've got access to the legitimate top-tier working royals, why would you fraternise with um, a self-imposed um, in-exile couple? I mean, it just doesn't make sense and their power seems to seep away day by day. Bronte, you'll recall a bit of a bust-up between the Sussexes and the Beckhams. Apparently this week there's a bit of an update. Yeah, this has been a big story this year. You know, uh, David Beckham and Prince Harry actually have a really long history together and they were quite close friends. The Beckhams were at the Royal Wedding. A quick recap on the feud. It seems that, from all reports, Harry and Meghan uh, accused David and Victoria of potentially leaking stories about them to the press. This obviously offended the Beckhams. Now, uh, what's happened recently, to add what can only be fuel to this feud, is uh, that David Beckham is now having talks with the King himself, apparently about becoming an ambassador to his charity, which, of course, makes his position on the royal family feud very, very clear. Uh, and also, it's against this backdrop of everyone's talking about the Beckham's documentary, which had the biggest premiere on Netflix since Harry and Meghan's documentary early this year. So there is a direct comparison, of course. And the difference is that unlike Harry and Meghan's, which, of course, had huge rating success, uh, the drop-off after that was quite severe in terms of their popularity and then follow-up projects. If anything, it, it actually seems to have done a lot of damage to their reputation, as we've discussed on this show. But with the Beckham's, what's now being spoken about is, uh, well, them all over the world, but also a follow-up with uh, Victoria Beckham potentially now having her own dedicated series for Netflix. They're riding high on a wave of popularity and uh, it's a real jarring um, position that they're in compared with Harry and Meghan's and particularly with David now getting closer with the King apparently. That's delicious. And, Louise, there's yet another report um, of an apparent plan that Harry had to try and take over William in the popularity stakes. I'm not sure what this plan was, but I don't think it's worked. Yeah, it's very intriguing. It's sort of a theory being posed by Dr Raj Pasod, who's a, a quite a well-known clinical psychiatrist in the UK and often gives his views on celebrities and what they're really thinking and what their motives are. His theory is that Harry's... Uh, potentially, Harry's sustained attacks on his family kept him in the headlines and therefore gave him more kind of media acreage than his brother, ergo made him more important than his brother, of course, who is the future king. And I, I, don't, I don't understand the sort of science behind it, really. It's a delicious theory, to use your word from earlier, in a way that um, <laughs> he's somehow got some one-upmanship on his brother. But we all know in the reality is, of course, he's, uh, he cannot um, hold a candle to his brother as far as, you know, international footprint and reputation. Yeah, I think that's a very fair insight.